Hi, I'm Cindy Houston, Director of Wendell Foster's Technology and Resource Center. We are one of five assistive technology resource centers in the state of Kentucky. We offer a variety of services, including complimentary short-term loans, device demonstrations, and a reuse program. Assistive technology is any device that helps someone with a disability have more independence. These devices can range from low-tech to high-tech. Cindy and I will be showing you a variety of these devices and we hope that you will find this information helpful. So these are switches. Switches are the cornerstone to assistive technology. And as you will see, they come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Um, this is a basic switch. You can see it has a large surface and it's flat. Sometimes a smaller switch is needed. So it's similar to the other one, but smaller device. And then you also have devices that have different outputs. So this is angled, so it might be easier for someone to activate if not being flat. Um, you press it, you hear the vibration, the music, and it lights up. So that might appeal to someone who needs more input when they push a switch. Um, it is important that someone pushes a switch early on, that they learn those switch skills, because that will help them operate something or complex in the future, such as a communication device or a wheelchair. This is another example of a soft textured switch that might entice someone who doesn't like the hard plastic feel. And then if someone has a vision impairment, they push this switch and it lights up and vibrates. So this is similar to a switch that might be found on a wheelchair. So it gives you good practice for driving a wheelchair later on. This is called a micro light switch. It's very small and it just takes the slightest touch of a finger. And then also you can activate something with your breath. And this is a sip, sip and puff switch. And basically it can operate two devices in one. So you sip on the straw and activate one thing. You can puff into it and activate another. And finally, we have switches where you don't even have to touch the surface at all. This is a proximity switch. You just wave your hand over the surface and it will light up and it will activate. Over here, we have some mounts that help bring the switch up to the person. Um, these are single mounts. They're very flexible. And this is attached with Velcro. This is an example of mounting an iPad to put it level so much someone can, can use it. Um, and then we also have switches, switch mounts. We have two. So this can go over a bed and over a chair and it just makes it a little sturdier. <clears throat> Sometimes you're in a situation where you need something that's not quite so flexible. So someone who's in a wheelchair might accidentally knock against something and that can knock that mount out of the way. So you need something a little more rigid. And this is an example of that. This is a hover mount. And it does have the joints where you can arrange it to where it meets the user easy, easily. Um, this is a gooseneck mount. And this basically is the same thing, but it's just a lot more rigid. So mounts, you just have to guess and see what is best for that user. So Jana talked a little bit about access and how switches can activate certain things. And one of those things are switch adapted toys. Um, play is very important to young children. Um, it motivates learning and helps teach them cause and effect. Um, so I'm gonna demonstrate a couple of our switch adapted toys. I'm using some, some switches. Um, this is a wobble switch, so it's really good for a child who has limited um, mobility. So just by activating the wobble switch this way it activates the toy. Um, and then you can just easily change the switch and activate another toy. Ta-da! Okay, um, this is another different type of switch. It's plugged into this um, toy. And again, it has a very large surface. It has a tactile surface. Um, so by activating the switch, it activates the toy. Um, and then one more here, you can just use the switch on different types of toys. Um, that. So 
that's a fan. Um, provides some light and visually stimulating for the child. Here are a variety of switch adapted plush toys. Um, I'm gonna demonstrate a few of them. This is my favorite, it's a little puppy. The younger kids love these. Um, and this is another favorite of mine, it's the Funky Monkey. So you push it to activate it, and then you push it again to stop it. So that really helps teach um, children cause and effect. So children love to blow bubbles. Um, and a lot of children with limited mobility are not able to do that. Um, so this is a switch adaptive bubble blower, um, and it's just activated by a switch, any kind of switch. It's important to have age appropriate toys for every child. Um, so we have some switch adapted water guns, which makes for some really fun summertime play. Play is important for all ages. Um, these are a couple of switch adapted toys uh, for elementary and middle school age students. Um, Monopoly obviously is a family favorite. Um, and this is really good for teaching turn taking and for learning money skills. Um, Hi Ho Cherry, everybody remembers that. Uh, from their childhood, great way to um, teach math skills. And then of course, my favorite, Uno, um, is a fun option for teaching matching skills. We try to offer a variety of toys that would be appealing to all ages. Um, these are some that I've referred to as boy toys, although girls like them too. Um, this is a, a racer, can be activated by any switch. And then this one, which is Jana's favorite. Um, that's real popular among the teenagers. Um, and then these are a couple of options for remote control toys. Um, if you notice the option here that it's a joystick with really large arrows. Um, for a child with very limited motor skills, a typical um, remote control car is going to be very difficult to navigate independently, so it's nice to have options available for them. And last but not least, for the musician lover, we have some switch adapted drums and musical instruments um, that are always the parents' favorites. So we've talked about before how these devices range from low tech to high tech. These are devices that help someone with a disability um, just kind of go through their daily life. Um, so a low tech example would be, can be something as simple as a highlighter. So someone who reads maybe needs, this will help with memory. Um, and then we have things like scissors. So you'll notice there are four holes here. This is so someone can do hand over hand and teach the child how to cut scissors. So those are low tech examples. Um, another example of scissors is this is switch adapted. So you plug in your switch and it will cut your scissors electronically. Um, that's more of a mid -tech, tech example. So another example to daily living are the reachers. And I think a lot of people just have these in their home to help them reach um, up high. You think about somebody who's in a chair, this can really help them navigate their house. And then something as simple as a slant board for a child who's working on writing skills. This might help them to um, write more easily than being able to do that on a flat surface. So it's also important for someone with a disability to be able to um, be in control of their environment. So if you think about if you're in the car with someone and or if you're listening to music that you don't really like, that's not, um, that's not being person-centered. So this is something that helps a person with a disability have control over a music player. You see they have larger buttons. Um, it, it, con it connects by Bluetooth, so they control music like on a phone. Um, and then controlling your television. You see right here, this is just a typical remote you program to a TV. You can put switches in here to turn it on and off, to change the channels and to change the volume. And then also we have environmental controls like Amazon Echo. Um, this is an Echo Dot. And this is an example of assistive technology that was not created
for someone with a disability, but can be used by that person. Okay, and this is a power link. So a power link is a great way to switch adapt something that has an on and off switch, um, like a typical device, like a lamp. Um, you can turn a blender on and off with a switch. Another example is a fan. So, um, and a music player. So if you have like a tape, an old tape player or a CD player, you can um, use this device to program that item. So we have some items here that are for people who are on a, what's called a sensory diet. And these are items that help to produce a calming effect, which is great for focusing in the classroom. Um, this is a wiggle seat. You see, it's very flexible. The child can sit on this and they can get that vestibular input, that movement, and um, be able to focus without being a disruption in the class. This is an example of a weighted vest. So it has little sandbags in here um, that produce pressure on the body and that can have a calming effect. And then this is especially good with someone with autism. Um, a child might have a hard time being in an assembly where it's especially loud. And so wearing these earmuffs can, can be, keep them calm and keep them um, from being a, a distraction. And so we've set up a power link here for an example of how to use one. We have it set up to, to turn on this lamp and here's our switch out here. I have it to where it, it offers direct selection. So you push the switch and it turns it on, you let go of the switch and it turns it off. You can also put it in a different mode, it's called latch mode. So you press the switch, it stays on. You press it again to turn it off. And finally, there's a time second mode. So you push the switch, it turns it on, and then turns it off after the allotted time. So this is just an important way to continue to teach those switch skills um, so that they can use those later on in their life. So this is an Echo Dot. It is an example of an, a product from Amazon to allow you to use your voice to turn an appliance on and off in the home. So Alexa, turn on lamp. Alexa, turn off lamp. And this is the beams. This is an, another example of a toy or item that was not created specifically for people with disabilities, but it can certainly be used by them. So this allows someone who, to use a large hand movement to play a device. So we're gonna play some music just by waving our hand and breaking the beams. So there are lots of songs that you can download, um, lots of opportunities to play songs that um, maybe you wouldn't have had if you had a disability. Communication is an essential part of daily life. Um, it's not one size fits all, so it's really important to be able to try multiple devices to uh, find out the appropriate communication method uh, for that individual. Communication devices range from low tech to mid tech to high tech. Um, some low tech things are just um, some picture boards. It could be homemade picture boards. You could um, use a software program to make something like this that is laminated, but it's just something very simple. Um, it has the picture symbols, it has words, and just allows that individual to point and let you know what they want. Um, some mid-tech items are single and uh, multiple message communicators. Um, for example, this, you can just, uh, to single message communicator, Hi, you just push the button. Come here and talk to me, please. And it tells that person that they need help. Um, so for example, Hi, if- Come over here and talk to me, please someone is in a wheelchair and they're trying to get um, a hold of a staff then they can push that button and the staff knows that they need assistance. Um, these are talkables. Um, so you can see that uh, there are talkables two, three, and four and it's great for options. Um, for example, this one, you can just do something as simple as yes and no. You can record messages on it. You can use that as um, to, to use it for options for meal choices or activity choices. Um, you can start with something, again, like uh, two messages and you can progress up to three or four. Mid-tech devices um, are static displays. So it means that um, you can push a button, Eek. but it does not progress to another 
screen. Um, these are really simple, easy to use, portable. Um, you can actually create um, multiple overlays. So you can interchange them um, easily and quickly and you can record up to five levels. This is a Logan Prox Talker. Um, it's based on the um, PEX program, which is Picture Exchange Communication System. Um, it uses the picture symbols, but it also has audio um, output. I want So you can interchange. Puzzle. Thank you. And then you push the green button and it actually reads the whole sentence to I you. I want to play puzzle. Thank you. So it's a great way to communicate, plus also work on sentence structure. So we've talked about low and mid-tech communication devices um, that have just simple, easy to record messages and static displays. This is an example of a dynamic display. Um, it's a communication app, and um, a dynamic display means that if you push a button, um, what? that it's going to advance to another page and give you multiple options. Um, there are a variety of different communication apps available. We actually have several iPads with um, different apps downloaded so that consumers can borrow the iPads and work with their speech therapist to determine the best communication method for them. This is our telecommunications access program cabinet provided by the Kentucky Commission on the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. And um, it contains a lot of amplified phones and captel phones, um, alerting devices. These are all products that are available free of charge to eligible consumers in the state of Kentucky. Um, it's just a matter of completing paperwork um, and submitting it. Um, to the state and you can receive um, a phone and the uh, signaling alerts every five years. This is a CapTel phone. Um, it uses a third-party relay service to allow a person with a hearing impairment um, to have a conversation with someone. Um, the relay person actually transcribes um, what the person on the other end is saying so that the person with the hearing impairment can read the message. Um, this relay service is also available on your computer and on your mobile devices. Uh, so it's nice to have both options because not everybody has an iPad or a smartphone um, or they may not be comfortable with the technology. These are a few other low-tech devices um, that can be used for people with hearing impairments um, such as alerting signals for people who um, need some supports waking up or if they want to make sure they hear the phone ring. Um, it could be set up so that a lamp flashes when the phone is ringing or the doorbell um, is ringing. And um, obviously, amplified sound of any sort. Um, so, speakers. This is a really neat device. It's called the Ubi Duo, and it's great for face to face communication so that the two communication partners can sit across from each other and type their messages out. This is our low vision station. Um, we have a variety of different types of magnifiers available for consumers to try. Um, this is a desktop magnifier. Um, it has some really nice features on it. Um, you can change the different backgrounds. Um, some people see better with the yellow background and black print. Some people uh, see better with this type of background. So it gives you a lot of different options. Um, and then of course you can zoom in um, as well. So the downfall of this is that you can only use it at home. It's not very portable. Um, so then there's another option. Um, it's called the Traveler. Um, and it's a little bit smaller, but it does come in a, in a nice bag. And so it's, um, it's a little bit easier to transport. Um, but basically the same features. Um, you can change the backgrounds. and then you can zoom in and out. And then the most portable um, is something about this size. They come in lots of different um, styles. This is called a pebble. This is great for um, going out to eat at restaurants or going to the grocery store um, because it doesn't have to be on a flat surface. Um, you can just hold it up to something and, and, and read what's on it. So one of the benefits of our center is that you can try um, equipment and make sure it's going to be a good fit before you purchase it. Uh, for example, a desktop magnifier costs around $2,000, so 
you want to make sure it's going to be the right fit for you before you spend um, the money to purchase it. So I want to highlight a few other things that we have for um, individuals with low vision. These are some really low tech items um, such as um, calculators with um, larger buttons or talking calculators, um, check writing guides that can also be used under a desktop magnifier, um, an eye fill. So if you're at the grocery store, you can just put the bill in and it tells you what um, the dollar bill is. Um, talking thermometers, um, different types of remote controls, um, some leisure things, um, for example, just some dominoes that are larger. Um, and then um, one of the things that we just recently got, it's a new item, it's called the Wii Walk and it is a smart cane. Um, so you can pair it with your smartphone and it really increases the navigation opportunities for people with low vision. Um, this is a light box. It's used a lot for young children with visual impairments. Um, there are different overlays that can go over the light box and just a learning um, tool for them. So here are some options for someone with a disability to access a computer um, that is easier now than ever before. So here's um, a couple of different keyboards. This is an example of one with contrasting letters. So someone with a vision impairment might be able to see the black on the yellow better than the typical white on black or black on white. Um, this is called an Orbi Touch, and you'll see the little letters here. So instead of having to use a single finger to push a key on a keyboard, you can use a large hand movement um, that's assigned to each section. So you'll be able to type better that way. Um, there's also features like Dragon. So this is speech recognition software. Uh, you use your voice to type on a computer. This is actually able to um, be downloaded now from a website. And there's also built-in features in a computer. Um, so you can just simply use those accessibility features that are in there to um, type with your voice. Here's some mice, different mice options. This is a large trackball. So you can see why this would be easier for somebody who doesn't have those fine motor skills to, to operate the cursor. So your left and right click are right here. Roll that. Here's a joystick mouse. So again, the joysticks are great. Um, this is a head mouse. So you basically put this on and this is a bite click. You click on that and, and activate your cursor. Um, and then down here we have some interfaces. So if you have um, an individual who needs to use a switch like we've shown you before, the little jelly bean switches or the big red switches um, for a computer, then you can plug them in here and then switch and hook this up to your computer and they'll be able to operate it that way with the switch that they're used to operating with. So if it's a touch screen, you can actually hook this up to a hand and this will telescope in and out and they can uh, make selections with that tip. And then also with their head. So this is something that straps to the head. It straps to the chin and they just have to move their head back and forth and in and out to make selections that way. The computers that are made these days actually have built-in features um, like the voice recognition software. Um, so you can just go into the accessibility system settings in Windows and in on your Mac and there are lots of options there. Um, being able to just speak to your computer and having it type it out. Um, also making the mouse cursor larger if you have vision impairment, and then also making the text on the screen bigger. So um, with something called a magnifier. So there are lots of options there and I just encourage you to go into your accessibility settings and just kind of play around and see. So here's an example of how to access a computer with just your eyes. This is a Toby eye gaze device. Um, I have it calibrated to my height and the way that I'm sitting. And so, Let's see if we can get it to work. So with just my eyes, I activated the games and experiences. Okay, just like there were built-in features on PCs these days, there's also built-in features for accessibility on iPads. So the same things you can kind of do on a PC, you can also do on an iPad. So just go into the accessibility settings. Um, you'll find that there's zoom, so you can make the text on the screen larger and smaller. 
um, speak screen that's just, just with a swipe down um, of two fingers. Um, there's all kinds of options out there. Also, you can set up a wireless switch to play um, switch accessible games. So this is an example of a switch accessible game called Five Little Aliens. Um, you press a wireless switch that's hooked up to it and it will make the selection. So here's an example of just a basic wireless switch here with a large surface. Um, here's a smaller, more angled one. And then these are switches that have switch interfaces built into them. So you can actually use these two as switches, but you can also connect an outside switch, like the large big red switch I mentioned earlier into this device. So if they're used to using that particular switch, you can still operate an iPad with that, just with a switch interface. Um, as far as styluses go, the same ones we use for a touch screen for a computer can also be used for an iPad. So here's another one of those that have this telescoping handle and they can attach to the wrist. And then also you can operate an iPad with your head, make selections that way. So they're also um, AT for, for individuals with learning disabilities. I already talked about how these are oftentimes built into computers and iPads. Um, features that are free text to speech, uh, word prediction, word banks can be helpful and highlighters. So all these options can help someone who's struggling to read or write. Um, so these are software tools that used to be um, the thing to go to for those. Um, they're now outdated because they are available. Um, the same type of service is available already in accessibility settings. So this is Clicker 5. Write Out Loud is another example and then CoWriter 4000. So all of these have basically been built into computers these days, which is a great convenience for a lot of people. Also the reading pens, great for someone with dyslexia who's trying to um, overcome that. So you turn it on, you scan a word, it'll read it to you. And it's great for the classroom because you can put headphones in your ears and listen to it instead of it talking out loud to everyone there. So, great tool for children with dyslexia. Wendell Foster participates in two statewide initiatives, Project Carrot and Ramp Up Kentucky. Project Carrot is an effort to um, reuse durable medical equipment to consumers and the community. Um, as you can see, we have a variety of different types of uh, gate trainers, strollers, standers, um, wheelchairs that are available to consumers free of charge. Um, and then our Ramp Up program uh, we are able to loan portable ramps to consumers for up to six months at a time. Um, this is beneficial for um, if someone is waiting to have a permanent ramp built or maybe um, somebody just had surgery and they just need a short-term accommodation. Um, this is a great service to, to utilize. Here we have some seating options for children. Um, seating is important to maintain proper trunk alignment and to get them in a position to, to maybe work on some other things. Um, here's an example of some floor sitters. So this will sit on the floor and you'll be able to strap the child in safely. This is a ladybug chair. It, it's more upright position. So if the child is able to sit more upright, that's more ideal for them. Um, down here we have some floor sitters that are flexible. So this is a go-to seat. You can, um, it, it comes with a stand that will sit on the floor, but you can also take this soft seat off and put it in a chair or a shopping cart or a wagon and take them outside for a walk. So that's a very versatile product. Um, and then seating also comes in high-low options. So this is a Riften high-low chair. Um, it will go up and down and it will also tilt back and forth. So there's just a variety of seating options, just depending on the child's need and what um, type of work they're trying to accomplish. Hey, we also have other positioning options, such as this tadpole positioning system. So these pieces can be rearranged so a child can work on sitting up to begin with. Um, there are lots of different varieties of positions you can do with these. And then down here we have wedges in different widths. So you can also work on uh, positioning in an upright position from lying down. Um, 
So all these things can kind of be segued into more complicated, more um, involved positioning equipment. So here are examples of a couple of our standers. Um, obviously these are child size. Standers are important um, to promote healthy digestion, to promote circulation, and to work on prolonged stretching. So this is a bantam sit to stand. Basically the child can sit down like they're in a chair and then you can raise the back up until they're at the standing position that you need. And then this is a smaller sander called a squiggles. So these are examples of gait trainers and walkers. Um, these are child sized. So the importance of gait trainers and walkers is that it promotes standing, which can help um, with digestion. Um, it can also put them at a level where they can better interact with their peers. And of course it builds strength in their legs. So this is an example of, a, this is called a kid walk. Um, it is a pretty, it has more support than this typical walker here. Um, so you can see where there's more side supports. Um, there's actually support in the middle. So there's not such a risk of falling. So kids can start off on this and hopefully they can move on as they build strength to something like a simple walker. So these are, this is an example of an adaptive stroller. Um, they're different from regular strollers in that um, typical strollers are only for a certain age group. So once your child hits say two or so, they're gonna need something that's supportive still, but will allow them to um, go out into the environment. We are open to the public and serve all ages and abilities. Um, anybody can utilize our services, including family members, service providers, such as physical therapists, occupational therapists, and speech therapists. Just give us a call, we'd be glad to be of assistance.